Welcome to the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers. There are no traffic jams along the extra mile when you're studying for your bar exam. And now your hosts, Jackson Mummy and Megan Saya from Celebration Bar Review. Everybody, welcome. Hi, Megan. How are you? Hi, doing well. How are you? Good, good. It's you only got a couple of weeks of school left for the kids, right? Yes, a week and a half. So <laughs> counting down, go. please. But who's counting? Yeah. So there you go. All right. For those of you who are with us today, we're glad to have you here. It's uh, a little more than a couple of weeks to your bar exam if you're taking the July test. We're looking at probably, what, about eight weeks or so right now? Something like that. So um, getting closer, but we're not, it's not on top of us yet, is it? Yeah, no. I'm really proud. I feel like the students that I talked to this week, and there were many of you, felt very calm, seemed very confident about just, I'm just going to keep moving forward. I've got the time to do this. I just need to put one foot in front of the other. So I was really happy with how it sounds like the general mood seems pretty good right now. I thought so too. I thought so too. On my cryometer, I only had one or two conferences and in tears a day. I thought that was pretty good for me. Uh, let me explain why everybody wants to work with you. I don't know. But anyway, so we're glad you all are here with us today. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about a new report that we got from the National Conference of Bar Examiners this week. It's the 2020 statistics. So it's always produced on a delay basis, but we've now finally got the numbers from 2020. And they're shocking and not in a good way, I think, in, in many respects. So we want to talk a little bit about that. The other thing I want to say is we've been doing lots of interviews with successful students and we've had a couple. I I talked about one I did with Delisa and we have been getting these remarkable comments. If you haven't seen that, just go to the comments and and read what people are saying. They are mind blowing. I knew this was a great interview and people have just been pouring their hearts out and what a great compliment to her, to Delisa, and, and thanks to her for sharing her story. We've got some great interviews that just came out. We just did one with one of your students, Chase, in California, and I'm very excited about that. If you want to have an awesome, fun 15-minute interview, Chase is your she's your woman. I, I got to tell you, she is just all over the place and so enthusiastic and so honest and just used all of these different tools, coaching with you, photo reading, mind mapping, the abundance for bar study masterclass, all of those things. And she was one of what, 1150 people that passed the Cal bar in February. Yeah. Yeah. She was a repeater. So that, that pool was much smaller, (laughs) much, much smaller. And, and, and so that leads me, I I normally let you control the agenda. I know I've hijacked you here, (laughs) but it's that kind of a day. But one of the things that keeps coming up is that we track, obviously, a lot of data points. And one of the data points we've been tracking for the last couple of years is how do people do if they've used the personal writing workshop that Megan teaches? And the results are pretty extraordinary, aren't they? Yeah, I, we are. It's It's been great. I'm seeing so many of the people who pass. I have worked with them on at least the personal writing workshop Many of those people then go on to either do full coaching with me or do at least two additional calls with me. And then, yeah, that's who I'm seeing on that pass list. So definitely I'm here. If you need that, you need that push over the finish line. (laughs) I am moving heaven and earth to have capacity because I know I just, there's been a lot of demand and I really I love helping you guys. I love it. And so I am trying, I'm doing everything I can to continue to make room in my schedule for coaching calls and personal writing workshop calls. So yes, but I can't promise it will last forever. So I'm trying my best. It won't. But, you know, I I just want to tell you folks, if you're thinking, "Ah, I don't want to spend any more money. Look, this is money that seems to make a real difference. And Megan is a terrific coach. And she takes the material and repackages it for these two sessions in a way that I think makes it really accessible to people and gives them an opportunity to understand the mechanics, which then make everything else go so much smoother, whether you're doing coaching with Megan or coaching with me, or you're just working in the basic course and trying to figure it out on your own. 
an hour that's really focused on you and the mechanics of writing seems to be the, the secret sauce for so many people. And I keep hearing that when I'm doing these interviews, it's a consistent theme. I did photo reading. I took the personal writing workshop. I got coaching. I did mind maps. Those are the things that seem to be making a difference for people and moving the needle. And in a world where, as we're going to talk about, the pass rates are pretty dismal, I think you want to make sure that you're doing everything you can to give yourself a chance to be successful. So if finances are tight, the personal writing workshop is probably the most cost effective thing I think you could add to your course. So I really want to encourage people to do that. And every year what happens is we get folks that wait till the very end and say, oh, could I do it? And you just don't have capacity. First come, first served. And today, as we're talking, there's space. A week from now, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> so that's the deal. All right. So now, with that commercial interruption, I'll hand back the agenda to you, Megan, and you can talk about what you want. But that, that just, I was just kind of riffing on things that, that seemed important to me today. Yeah. All right. So the big news in the bar this week was that we got the 2020 statistical report, as you alluded to. And so, Jackson, we've got some time. I would love to hear your thoughts about what stood out to you in these statistics. What do you think is happening? Can we tell anything? 2020 was a weird year. Does this tell us anything about the direction the bar is headed or, or what we can expect going forward? Yeah, I think that that's, that's the $64,000 question. Is it predictive? Because it was such a strange year. And again, just for those of you that didn't live through that in the bar exam world, what happened was we had a massive number of jurisdictions that instead of giving a traditional bar exam in July, which virtually no one did, they went to online versions of tests. They went to what was called a plan B, which had either only a hundred multi-state type questions and not graded like a multi-state. In other words, they couldn't scale it quite the same way. Or in some cases, they just jettisoned the MBE portion altogether there were open book exams. There were all of these different things that happened. And and you had people studying, getting ready for a July test, and then it became August, and then it became September, and then in some cases it became October. And it had a, just a crazy impact. I think you and I both aged probably five or 10 years in the course of six months. It was unbelievably stressful for everybody involved. Now, the way that reporting works, score reporting works, is that it is on a delayed basis. And so a number of jurisdictions don't give out their statistics at all. And the National Conference of Bar Examiners then collects them from all 50 states and some territories. And they put together a annual yearly report. And that report generally comes out in May of the next year. So we just got that report. And I'm going to lead with what is to me the lead story in all of this. But uh, I know other people have different takes. The lead for me is that for repeat bar takers in all of 2020 across all jurisdictions, so now we're aggregating everything, all the craziness, all the plan B, everything that happened, the pass rate for repeat bar takers was 33%. That is a staggeringly low number. And it is a, it, it, I don't know, I'm not sure terrifying is the right word, but it is a sobering number to be sure. The first time pass uh, rate was 76%. And that's a misleading number because there were so few bar takers. It, it tended to skew in a very strange way. There were 40,000 first time takers total for the entire year in all jurisdictions. That's a very small number. And there were over 20,000 repeat bar takers in that same year. That's also a very small number. So everything skewed very differently than it normally does. When you get to the numbers for July versus February. In February, there were 8,000 first-time takers across the country and 11,000 repeaters. And in July, there were 31,000 first-timers and only 9,000 repeaters. That is a very weird sort of influx. And it changes the numbers, and it obviously impacts the numbers in some significant ways. And if we take that a little bit further, I think, and it'd be interested in your thoughts, it had an impact on the February 2021 results because there was such a short turnaround time, particularly in big states like Florida and California. Is that your take as well? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Particularly looking at California doing that, it was just almost no time 
the people, and we talked about this last week, the people we know who were successful in California in February were people who had take, if they took it in October, they started studying almost immediately afterwards and did not wait to get their results before they started studying again. So yeah, the yeah. switch was just. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> and so that, that had an impact in February of 2021. But now going back to 2020, I want to highlight some specific jurisdictions because I think there's some really interesting numbers. I'm going to start with one of the ones that just surprised me deeply. That's the repeat bar taker pass rate in Alabama. Now, in Alabama, the repeat bar taker rate was 15, 1.5%. That's it. Is it really that tough to practice law in Alabama? You got to wonder. California, obviously big jurisdiction, had... 6,700 repeat bar takers for the year. That's a very small number for them and a 34% pass rate. So just barely above the national average. And typically they would be below that, but because they had so few takers, I think it, it impacted those numbers. District of Columbia, which is a UBE jurisdiction that we often recommend, here's why we recommend it. The repeat taker pass rate was 40%. So if you're thinking about Alabama versus D.C., 15 versus 40, there's something going on there, right? It's the same test in both jurisdictions. How do you get, you know, such a weird disparity? So I like D.C. I've always liked D.C. I like it more and more. Then we go back to Florida. I'm going alphabetically, if you can't tell. Mm -hmm. And in Florida, we've got a weird circumstance. As Florida doesn't uh, release their repeat bar taker pass rate. They just don't do it. We have to wait for the National Conference to tell us. And so it's this Florida hide the ball game that they play. But here's the number if you've been waiting. The repeat bar taker pass rate for 2020 was 24 percent. There were 1,600 repeat bar takers, only 388 passed. I'm proud that a big number of those 388 came from Celebration Bar Review. But I got to tell you, that is a horrific number, 24 percent. Does that make sense to you that Florida would be worse than California? Yeah, I just, no, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> to me. I, I'm not sure. And this is where it comes down to what we were talking about, that how predictive is this of a normal year? I, yeah. I don't know. Do we expect to see that all the time? Or is that a, there's something wonky happening? I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I'm not either. And it, it just, it just, frustrates me because that number and the fact that they hide it, yeah. I think it is an indication that they just don't want people to know how bad it is and how weird it was. And in, certainly in the fall test where they, they didn't even do a multi-state, right? They just replaced it with their Florida questions. It clearly had an impact. I don't think there's any way to get around that. Uh, the repeat bar taker pass rate in February was 24%. And then in when we got to the repeaters in July, it was a, a bigger group of people, but still only 24, 25%. So I don't know, it's weird. It, it's a strange set of numbers. Then we go to Georgia, a state that again, had a weird set of exams, particularly in the fall, and their repeat taker pass rate was 26%. So not much better than Florida's, and again, California is looking like the star in this group, which is not what you would have expected going in. Again, a fairly small number of repeat bar takers. And I think this is the thing that just jumps out at me as I look statistically, it's just the small numbers as we go across. I wanna highlight a couple of other states for you that I think are significant. One of them, of course, would be New York. And in New York, the repeat bar taker pass rate was 29%. So again, New York, now what New York did that was different than the other jurisdictions is that they said, you can't take this exam in 2020 if you've taken it more than twice and failed. So they kept the number of repeat bar takers to a very small number. There were only 146 repeaters in New York in July. That is crazy. That was the, the exam where they cut it back. Typically they have about 2,000 or 2,500. So there were 146 repeaters in that fall 2020 exam. Is that nuts? If you don't make it possible for people to take the exam, I guess your pass rate goes up. <laughs> yeah. New Mexico, another UBE state by comparison, had a repeat bar taker rate of 58%. So another jurisdiction that I constantly am talking up is New Mexico. 
Now, you know why? New Mexico and D.C., you see those numbers. They are radically different than what we're seeing in right. states, some of the other UBE states. And, and same then, uh, test, same, same test. test. That's the, same great. Test. That's the like neon sign I want people to to take note of is like exact yeah. same test. It's not that it's not that right. it's an easier test. Same test, same study process, everything the same, just different. The person right. grading it is in a different part of the country. <laughs> That's it. So who knew that Alabama would be tougher than New York? And you know, I don't know. Okay. I think last state I want to talk about is Texas. And that's also an anomaly because Texas, oh my God, Texas did so many different versions of their exam. <laughs> they gave they gave a full two and a half day exam. They gave a two day exam. They gave a two day exam that was truncated. They gave a two day exam that was online. They gave a two day exam where you sat in a hotel room and what went online. It was every permutation you could come up with. And all of it amounted to a 38% repeat bar taker pass rate, but that test is gone. Right. <laughs> That's the UBE. So yeah. I don't know that any of that makes any difference, <clears throat> but I, I just, I wanted to talk about all that craziness that they had. So those are some of the states. You can find the link in the, the NCBE's website to their 2020 exam. There's lots of, of data there. And Megan, you and I walked over it for a good long while. The other number I think that you wanted to talk about, and I think it's right, is there's something called a floating 10-year average. The examiners go back 10 years in every jurisdiction and look at the overall pass rate uh, for first timers and then uh, the first time rate and the overall rate. They don't break out and give us a repeat taker rate. But for the past 10 years, uh, for all jurisdictions, the overall pass rate uh, 10 years ago was 69%. In 2020, it was 61%. So we've seen an 8% drop in the 10 year period. Now that's up. From it's been as low as fifty four percent overall, so it's it was a little better. It went fifty four percent three years ago, then fifty eight percent, then sixty one. But still, a big drop from where we were ten years ago. Whereas the first time taker pass rate stays pretty stable at about seventy six to seventy nine percent. So I think that's an interesting statistic. Anything else you saw in that ten year floating average that stood out to you? Yeah. I think it's uh, what's really important to note about that is that even though they don't give us the repeat average for the last 10 years, yeah. seeing that the averages for the, all the jurisdictions has gone down eight percentage points and that the averages for the first time takers has only gone down 3%. Obviously you do not have to like me, not a math genius, do not have to be a math genius to figure out that where are we bleeding these passers? We're bleeding them in the Peters. That's where it's just, that's where we're losing people. I think it's, obviously it is positive that that number went up to 61% from 54%. Yeah. And 2018 is, is pretty yeah. terrible. So it's positive that it went up. But again, I'm not sure yet what that means. Is it going to stay up because California, for instance, dropped their required yeah. score? And California has a huge number of takers. Okay, so is that helping? Or was it up because of pandemic craziness and weirdness yeah. and some grading anomalies? And it's going to go back down for 2021. We just can't tell yet. But it's definitely clear that the overall trend is down on these pass rates and has been going down for years and years. Which I think really speaks to the point that you have to do things differently. You just cannot go in and issue spot and memorize and cram and write IRAC and expect to be successful. It just doesn't happen. And if you're a repeat bar taker, the odds are stacked against you. You have to switch it up. And I know that we were talking to an audience here on, on this call today of people that have already made that decision, but I also know that this will go out as a podcast and we'll be talking to a broader audience and you're going to be saying, well, maybe I should just give up. No, don't give up, but do something different. If you don't take that step, then you're consigning yourself to such a low probability of success that I think it's very hard to be to pass. And even if you're in our course, I would say, again, avail yourself of the tools and the techniques that we offer. When we look at who's passing in that group of our students, it is consistently the people that photo read, that do the writing workshops, that get the coaching help, that integrate the, the mind maps into their studies. Those are the people that pass. And they're the people that we see their scores increase and it may take them a couple of attempts to get over the top, but they get there. And it's the people that just keep 
in their rut going through the same thing that I think really gets stuck. And do these numbers portend anything for 2021? It's hard to say. We know that the number of bar takers in February was so small. And we know that there's this tsunami coming in July of bar takers. And, and one of the questions really in my mind is, will all those July people, how many of them will bail out? We'll just say it's just too much mentally and, and emotionally and, and pull out. I'm not seeing a lot of that yet. Are you? No. And it's so interesting because we saw a ton of that in February yeah. for very yeah. valid reasons. So yeah. many people ended up deferring many people, even just right up to the edge there of the actual exam decided I'm just going to wait until July. So we're not seeing that this time so far. We'll let you know if we do. But as of right yeah. now, this seems to be a much more stable group than the February yeah, right. one. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So th that's my, uh, I've geeked out on the numbers. Uh, I, mean, <laughs> I could geekier, I could be geekier, but I think that gives you a, a broad sense of what's going on. Yeah. There's a question in the chat box. How will pass rates be any different with the new upcoming format of the test in 2025? We don't know. Right. I mean, it'll be a completely different test. It will have a, a holistic approach to it. It will not be graded in increments. We don't even know which states or jurisdictions will employ it. And the reason that's important is if California and Florida, which are not UBE jurisdictions, they may not even use this. They may stay in their existing format. And so that's going to affect pass rates enormously if those two big states stay out. I, I don't think anybody knows at this point. We don't even know what the criteria is for grading. This long-term new iteration, what, what are we calling it? The new generation bar exam or something? Yeah. Next generation bar exam really is. It's it completely unlike anything we've done. So I don't know. It's a great question. We've got three or four years to, to hear what they have to say and to get ready for it. But for right now, we're going to keep our eyes on the existing bar exam. Yeah, definitely. Good question. Yeah. Uh, this next student asked, do I have interactive lectures and where can I find them? Yeah, I think what they meant by interactive is what we call bar maps. And I want to explain bar maps because I think we're now reaching the point where this is a pretty useful product for people as they reach this seven, eight week period of study. Bar maps is actually a combination of three different tools. What we did was to take the video lectures in every subject, both state and multi-state, and we timestamped them and broke them into a menu so that when you go to the video lecture in bar maps, it's going to give you a set of six topics in each lecture, typically. And it's gonna say, click here to go to this part of the lecture, which I find wonderful. I was just talking to a student today in Con Law, and I was saying, if you're trying to figure out due process, which is not easy, there's a spot in the lecture. You don't have to go through eight hours of lecture to find it. Just click on that section that's in the heading, and it'll take you right to that section, and you can watch and listen to that lecture. So you've got this interactive part of, of bar maps. So that's one tool that comes in it. A second tool is that we've created mind maps, and mind maps are the visual representations of the subject. Now, what we did is we created mind maps using the table of contents from our books, going down two levels deep. So the main table of contents and then the second level uh, beyond Roman numerals one, two, three in the ABC. These mind maps can be downloaded and printed. You can also modify them, create your own using a program called MindMeister. And they've got a free program and a, a nominally you know, $25 a year kind of program if you want to do more with it. And But it gets you started. So it gives you the core of your mind map. I know a lot of people have you gotten this comment, Megan, where people are like, I don't know how to start with a mind map? Mm. You know, they just stuck. And yeah, so it's a great it, skeleton to start you off. Yeah, and it, it's on a computer, so if you're like me and you can't read your own handwriting, I think it's a good <laughs> thing to do. Uh, if you're like Megan and you, you can handwrite and, and do them, because I know you say to people, just do the mind map. I mean, just don't let the technical part get in the way, but mm. here's a good way to get you started with that. So that's the second piece of bar maps. And the third piece of bar maps is something we call a fast finish audio. When you get down to this review stage, it's nice to listen to the lecture. You, have, you don't need to read it and see it on video, but you also can go faster. You've heard it before, maybe several times. And so in fast finish, what we did is we took the audio soundtracks and we sped them up without changing the pitch so we don't uh, sound like we're Alvin and the Chipmunks. And you can do a three hour lecture in a little under two hours. I think that's the average. 
And so these are designed to just put on, listen, maybe right before you go to bed or maybe when you're driving the car, what you're at the gym, whatever. And it's a great way to review. So now what we did is that bar maps, we have a separate bar maps for the multi-state and for the state. But if you're a registered Celebration Bar Review student, we've put all of that together for you and you save $200. I recommend bar maps for people. I think they make a big difference. Now, circle back around to the question. It's again, a separate set of links and you'll get those when you order and they're yours, they're permanent. So once you've got the link, you can use it as often as you want, uh, anytime you want. And I, I love bar maps, don't you? It's just a, it's just a great tool to, to help people get more focused in their studies. Yeah, definitely. And especially if you're tight on time and you don't yeah. have the time to start from scratch and make your own, it's just a big time saver as well. So yeah. Highly yeah. recommend, but like you said, Jackson, I'm always saying do mind maps. I don't care if you do bar maps or you do it on your own. I don't care if you use MindMeister or some other program yeah. or you handwrite it, Just like do, do it. mind maps, whatever they look like for you, you should do it. Yeah. All right, now I've got a few questions about photo reading. Is okay. there any difference in doing photo reading digitally versus hard copy? What are the pros and cons? Yeah, this is a question I get pretty frequently. And I think what happens is that people get freaked out because when Paul first taught photo reading and the lectures that he puts up on the learning strategies site, Paul Shealy is who I'm talking about, you didn't have digital, it just didn't exist. Yeah. And so after, after digital came along, they figured out how to do that. And when I came along to do it, digital was just starting to come in. And I worked with Paul and with Millicent St. Clair, and we really refined what we wanted to do digitally. And I talk about that in our photo reading for the, the bar exam, but here's the essence of it. You simply put the PDF up on your screen and I don't care if you go landscape or portrait. For some of you, you're gonna be unable, if you get old like me, landscape is too small to read sometimes. But here's the beauty part of photo reading. You don't actually have to be able to see the words sharply. So I, I know this is gonna sound weird. I photo read without my glasses. Now I am blind, but I don't need to be able to see the distinct outlines of the letters because my brain is already taking that information in and it's processing it. In fact, I actually read upside down and backwards just to make sure I'm not reading specific words. How crazy is that? But for me, landscape works fine. It doesn't matter that it's big enough. When people tell me that they've got to have it in portrait mode because they need to be able to see the words, they're actually beating, they're, de they're defeating the purpose of it. But if you felt like you had to do it, you could do that. You're just going to hit page down a whole lot more frequently, but it's the same idea. And what you want to do when you're photo reading on a computer, whether it's a laptop or a tablet or a desktop, is you want to basically set your eye gaze at the top of the screen so that you're looking past the screen itself. And that's just to give you a wide peripheral vision. doesn't matter if you see it or don't see it, or if you see all four corners of the page, or you see a blip page, any of those things. Those are all distractions for your conscious mind. They're just gimmicks to get your conscious mind, like throwing the, the bone out for the dog so that moose can run out in the yard and you can continue on with the webinar. And it, that's all it is. It's just getting your conscious mind to go chase the bone so your non-conscious can have what it needs. So don't worry about if you're doing it technically correct or not. Don't worry if you see the words or not. We have had many students who have had visual problems, dyslexia, blindness in one eye, all sorts of things, and it, it didn't impact them at all. In the same way, if English is not your first language, don't worry about it. Your brain's getting in the information, it's doing the translation and bringing it back in, and you don't need to think about it consciously. So don't let that part bother you, and you don't need to do a whole lot more with it. So that's the other part. And the last thing I'd say about this is if you are a new photo reader, with your photo reading for the bar exam, you've got a free conference with me. Schedule that, talk to me. Let me work with you one-on-one -on -one, and I'll show you how to do those things. But sometimes what happens is people want to send emails and say, you know, what about this, what about this? Just, just call me. I can show you how to do it. I've done this for almost 15 years now. We'll show you how to make it work and it does work. And by the way, when we did that interview with Chase this week, it was great. I asked her about photo reading. She goes, I have no idea how it works. I have no idea why it works. She said, but I still use it now, even though I'm done with the bar exam, because it works. And I think that's the, the that's probably the most important thing to hear is that it works. Even if you don't understand why or how, it just works. 
Great. We have a couple questions in the chat box about it. Scrolling versus page down. Most online reading is scrolling. Yeah. If you scroll is fine, but I just set up the landscape as a PDF and I hit page down. It's a setting in your device and it's a setting on your computer or whatever device you're using. But again, if it's scrolling, let it scroll, just speed up the scroll. That, that's really all that's going on. Again, don't make it more complicated than you need to. And if the scrolling really is a problem for you, Google, how do I stop scrolling on my computer? And it'll show you the setup and you can go for it. It's not that hard. Okay. And then TJ asks, so are you saying that when I'm photo reading and my eyes feel blurry and the words on the page start to get blurry, are you saying that's okay? I'm saying <laughs> that's good. That's what's supposed to happen. You don't, we don't need you. You are not involved in this process. Your eyes and your conscious brain are totally irrelevant to this process. Please take a hike. You know, go away. Just repeat the mantras, right? Repeat one, two, three, four, right? You, I know I say this all the time. People really don't believe it. Read it upside down and backwards, and you'll recognize very quickly that it makes no difference. You will still understand the material. It is not about, you are not reading. I wish he had called this anything except photo reading because it sounds like photographic memory and reading, and it's neither of those things. It's really page flipping. But I guess page flipping wouldn't have sold as well. So that's all, I'm going to call it. <laughs> all right. And then Reshma asks, when I photo read, I tend to do some of the step five activate tasks when I do step four post view. Is that incorrect? It's not incorrect. Activation really comes in intentional and spontaneous forms. The intentional activation that's built into the course is the lectures and the question practice. So we're activating for you. But if you want to activate by super dip and skim or skip, uh, super dip and, and skim and rapid read and rhythmic perusal and mind mapping, uh, you could certainly do that. I find post view, the post view for me is probably more like mind mapping if I'm going to do anything at all, it, because those are the keywords that jumped out at me. So when I photo read something, I tend to then just stop and just take a piece of paper and start mind mapping the words that are in my brain and then trying to rearrange them and figure out where I want them to go. And that's post view for me. And then I, I just elevate that into the activation a little more um, strategically. So that it's a great question, but that's what I would do. Great. Another, I think our last photo reading question, do I need other webinars related to photo reading beyond photo reading for the bar exam? And are they included in the course? Okay. So when you buy photo reading for the bar exam, you're going to receive in addition to all of Paul's lectures, you're going to receive my lecture specifically about using photo reading for the bar exam. And you're going to receive a webinar on mind mapping because we think that is really important. Then we have made, I have made over the years, some additional webinars based on teaching that, that you and I did at boot camp when we were doing live boot camps for going deeper with using photo reading and essay writing or performance tests or the multi-state and multiple choice questions. Those are not required by any means. They are additional and they include some additional resources, some PDFs, some tools, some additional examples. And we made them available if you want to add them to your course. Not everyone needs that and we don't want to charge everybody. And we could make photo reading seven or $800 product. We don't want to do that. So we give you the core of photo reading. And then if you say, you know what, I feel like I would, I could improve my essay writing better then buy that one webinar. It's $95, I think with unlimited replays. And there's all sorts of tools that, that come with that. But if you're doing okay and photo reading is working for you, there's no reason for you to add on the webinar. We're going to cover everything. We're not giving you, there's no gaps here. It's just a deeper dive on all of those pieces. One thing I would say, if you're, taking a performance test and everyone except Florida bar takers would be. We have a we have a lecture in the course about doing performance tests online. And that's a really good one to go through, whether you're a photo reader or not. And I would do that. And then if you are a photo reader and you want even more resources, you could certainly dive into that beyond that and, and add that webinar. So that's the reason we do it. It's just designed to give more flexibility and people can add the pieces that they want to their course. Great. 
All right. I've been giving myself approximately 1.7 minutes per question. I love the specificity of that. That is a math person. Unlike me, that's a math person. I've been giving myself approximately 1.7 minutes per question on MBE practice, but for some reason, recall Jackson stating a different number during last webinar. Am I on the right track or does he recommend we practice at a faster pace? I don't know what 1.7 minutes is. Maybe somebody <laughs> could do the math for me. What I want, so I'll just tell you what I want and then we'll tell you if we're, we're there. I want 90 seconds from start to finish. 90 seconds is the optimal time based on our data points for correct answers. And what we see is that after 90 seconds, from 90 to 110 seconds, effectiveness drops off a cliff. I mean, literally. We go from 75% accuracy and correctness down to 20% or less. It's pretty dramatic. And so that tells us that what happens is that you either know the answer or you don't, but that's based not on trying to analyze it, it's based on what we call selective intuition. So what I always invite people to do when they're asking these types of questions is to go into your multi-state video lecture series. There is a lecture I did called Selective Intuition. It is very important in the course, you should watch it. It demonstrates for you how to go through that. There is also a lecture I did I think it's a lecture or a webinar where I actually walk through how to answer an MBE question using selective intuition. There are plenty of resources in the course to take you through that, but you don't want to take too long. So did, I'll ask you now, did anybody come up with the math of what 1.7 minutes is? Oh, there we go. Reshma said 102 seconds. If we're taking an online exam, do you recommend studying in digital format only? Yes. <laughs> Good question. Yes, you should yeah, yeah, take it, uh, study how you're going to actually take it. Yeah, I think that's best. Which also, we haven't really talked about this as much this time, but for people who are going to be taking it in person, because that's more people this time than before, you need to check if masks are going to be required. And if they are, you should be studying and practicing with your mask on because you don't want that first time that you take an entire exam in a mask to be test day. Okay, so we have not talked about that really this time through, but Texas is in person still. There's a lot more people in person. Virginia, I believe, is in person. So anyway, if that's you, you should yeah. be practicing with a message. Yeah, I definitely think that's true. Cool. Uh, okay, and so then our last question for the day, I think is a great one to end on. Before okay. attending, I was having trouble with the term going all in because my mind thinks that means study and work. And then there was the term you used, balance, which now reassures my mind that it's okay to not postpone enjoying life until passing the bar. I know that I will pass, but I want to learn how to enjoy the journey of studying and doing all that I need to do to pass the exam while simultaneously finding some cool things, this weekend's assignment, to do along the way until I pass the bar. And last, I love journaling also. So I will start dumping each night and leaving the junk there and start fresh each morning. So... Yeah, that, it's, it's wisdom. It's great wisdom. I, I got nothing to add to it. I think it's exactly what needs to happen. So I think most people are in that, that zone right now as we started today. Keep going, guys. Keep doing what you're doing. I think the vast majority of you are right where you need to be, and uh, you're making great progress. And just take advantage of all these tools we're offering you. They do make a difference. And I think when you see those kind of comments, you realize how important uh, all of these things, whether it's group coaching or some of the other things that we offer can be. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Megan, for being here. And uh, just keep uh, driving towards this uh, July exam and uh, good results for people. So hang in there. Keep your focus on the work and don't get distracted. I know there's a lot to be distracting, but uh, keep going. I think you guys are doing great. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you. We'll see you again next week. Thank you. And uh, with that, we're going to sign off. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening and watching the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers at celebrationbarreview.com.